All right. So I think we are, um, I see that a few more of you guys have joined, so welcome. Uh, so far, all we have on the agenda is to uh, triage CDI issues. Thanks, Elvaro, I see that you've added uh, that we're on 2576. Um, so we'll get started on that. Um, if anybody else has uh, other topics that they wanna bring up, uh, please feel free to jump in. Uh, so we'd be happy to discuss those as well. Um, so I, see that uh, I have one question. I'm not sure yeah. where can I find this uh, doc to put my name there and agenda note. Sure. Yeah, it should have been in the, uh, the calendar, calendar actually, event. but I will add it to the chat so that you have it as well. Okay, we'll do that later. Um, my question is, if anybody tried to use wait for first consumer with Qubit with all machines, and how do you handle the um, node topology for the creating CDI uh, CDI uh, volumes? Like, I mean, if you want to create virtual machine with some node affinity rules or pod anti affinity, um, and if you trying to use CDI for that, the CDI pod for uploading data volumes created first, and it does not use these rules. I was just thinking about how we can um, arrange this with kubevirt virtual machines. Um, so who wants to answer that? Why don't you jump in, Alexander? Give it. You can start with it. Okay. So we we've thought about and 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 solved this issue in the current iteration. Uh, I think it'll be better once we get to populators, but that's uh, we're working on that, so that's not there yet. But basically, uh, what happens um, when you have wait for first consumer uh, when you um, create a data volume, nothing happens. It just sits there. Then when you create a virtual machine that uses that data volume, um, Kubevert will create what we call a doppelganger pod. So essentially it will make a pod that has all the same resource requirements as the actual VM that allows the uh, scheduler to you know, schedule it on, on whichever node it needs to be scheduled on. And that pod basically starts and exits immediately. But that causes the PVCs that it's associated with to get bound. As soon as the PVCs get bound, CDI sees that the PVCs got bound and will now start to import. The actual VM will not start because the actual VM is waiting for the data volume phase to be succeeded, which is not the case because CDI is important. Um, once CDI is done with importing, then all the data volume phases will be uh, successful. And then the VM will start on, on the node that the uh, scheduler put the doppelganger pod on, which should have the exact same resource requirements as the actual VM. So it should start. Got it. Thank you. Uh, is there any requirements from Kubevirt with all machine spec, uh, which should be specified there to make it uh, creating uh, to force it to create this kind of uh, data volumes. You, data volume a, template, isn't it? There's this feature gate in CDI uh, called feature Honor gate. First Consumer. Uh -huh. uh, if that's what enables all this machinery to happen, but there's nothing on the VM uh, spec itself that is required. As well from Kubevirt side, if I right. understand it well. Right, yeah. Okay, Kubevirt thank you. Yeah, Kubert, you shouldn't need anything, but yeah, all that machinery that Alexander talked about is behind a feature gate in CDI called on our wait for first consumer. That's on by default now, though, isn't it? Uh, we, the, as of recently. All, all the, the example deployments as of recently should have that on by default. I, I think 155 and below doesn't have it set in the deployment you know, that we publish. But you, you can add it's been um, it's been there for some time now. So we just haven't like you know turned it on by default. Okay, thank you. And sorry, one more question: What will happen if uh, data volume is created, but uh, virtual machine consuming this virtual volume is not? Uh, nothing will happen. 
and we'll just wait. It will wait. Uh -huh. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Right until there's a consumer of the of the PVC, CDI will not populate it. Uh huh. Got it. Thanks a lot. And um, in case you don't really care which node the volume ends up on, uh, you know, in case you have sort of like a uh, what we call the golden image workflow, where you have a bunch of images that you want to duplicate. Um, you can put an annotation on the data volume to basically ignore the way for first consumer and uh, it will just end up on a random node. Got it. Um, there should be documentation in CDI in the docs uh, folder on all of this. Right, thank you. Yeah, one of the things we have uh, on our list to take care of is to add some of the storage, like CDI specific or like more CDI focused documentation to the Kubert user guide, because um, that's usually the place where most people are looking for for docs and not in individual uh, repositories. So that's just a note for us to take as well that it could be important here. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... I have another question that's more likely an issue I mentioned in GitHub uh, that it that CDI does not work on default camo processors. I know that uh, since Red Hat OS 9, it's changed requirements for the uh, basic CPU architecture. It now it's x86 uh, version two. 60, uh, 64 version two, and but I was unable to run CDI in uh, standard virtual machines on Proxmos or on OpenStack. Uh, if we saying that CDI would work uh, also not for Qvirt workloads, but also like separated component, I think it might be useful to it support of this what are you what are the like what's the use case for that what are you um what would you be importing or i'm trying to understand how it's how it's used there okay uh we have some use cases when our users want to uh, clone the existing pvcs and i found cdi a really useful tool for that mm -hmm. For cloning and distributing, for example, if you have some uh, example database with content, you want to populate this content and to be used by the temporary pods if you want to test your application or if you want to transfer data from one uh, storage provider to another. CDI, CDI might be really useful in those cases. Yeah, there's also, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but there's an archive content type in your data volume. So you can actually import a uh, tar file um, and it will uh, it will expand it uh, like onto the root of the PPC as well. So that's a, like another way to lay down a file system or something uh, contents into a file system PVC. Um, I would say if you're encountering certain issues, uh, though, like uh, definitely post uh, or create an issue and upload the, uh, you know, the logs or the the issue that you're seeing, so that we could take a look at that. There's an issue already. He created. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I, I'm we sort of trying trying to understand. So your your problem essentially is, is that we're using CentOS nine as our base image, and that has a requirement that uh, that is not being met. Is that essentially what it is? Yeah, it does not work on uh, default processors, uh, which now are set by default by many virtualization platforms, and I think by many cloud providers. I guess that will change in a while, but currently it does not work. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite understanding where problem is so essentially something we're doing requires some cpu that is not being set by default on on many providers right yeah i just thinking that changing the i saw the many issues about that and every time people solving them by changing the 
CPU model has uh, by the changing the model, sorry, CPU model to the host side. Uh, but I think that will not always work but because users not always have this opportunity to change CPU type for their virtual machines. Yeah, that's the second issue from the top. All right, I'm just adding notes to the So the I think it here. Yeah, I, I just don't see the reason why it should not work because it's pure Go, isn't it? CDI is not using any C bindings. So maybe we have to it, change. It is some. for when using some of the MBD kit stuff that uses uh, uh, C binding. And I believe that. Yeah, would... maybe. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for bringing that up. So yeah, we can take a look at the the issue further and drill down and see what's going on. All right. Um, I see that we've got another topic added uh, by Michael, I believe. Uh, why don't you go ahead with that? Uh, yeah. I mean, just recently I've been talking to people in the chat and NVIDIA did that uh, Keyword Summit presentation. Um, there seems to be an interest in having like shared base images and, you know, writable layers. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, for just kind of efficiency sake, um, it's a good uh, optimization. And I think we've informally started talking about this internally, and I think it would be good to get input from the community um, on, on, you know, what their use cases would be if it's important to them. Um, you know, just get input from, you know, I think it's just something that we should acknowledge that we're thinking about and should get input from the community on. Like, for example, um, you know, it seems like we could pretty easily uh, make like a writable container disk image, you know, um, <laughs> which kind of, uh, would be a shared base image and it, like and just put the writable layer on the PVC, but I don't know if that's a good idea. It's just something um, we could probably pretty easily do. I think that sounds I've, interesting. I've always thought of one possibility that could be uh, interesting is so it's always uh, I found it always to be tricky when you have. Um, you know, QCOW two layers within a single disk image file, um, or I'm sorry, within like a, a logical a PVC, I should I should say to be clear. Um, so when it's a single PVC, um, for example, uh, if you have multiple layers, you, it's hard to predict the amount of like the, uh, space that you need in that PVC to store all of the, the data over time. Um, but anyways, I think an interesting use case could be that uh, you could define uh, the individual layers that you're using in your uh, virtual machine spec. And e if each layer was a PVC, so you could actually have a shared um, base layer that was brought in, for example, by a registry import. Um, uh, and then you could have a uh, QCOW2 layer that, that you define in another PVC that sits on top of that and actually back reference it. So it has a backing chain reference to that other PVC. Um, and if you did that and all those PVCs were attached to the VM, uh, you can tell libvirt to, you know, about all of those individual uh, images. I think that could be interesting. I shouldn't snapshot mechanism in Kubernetes API solve that issue. I mean um, that we have still the same PVCs and we just relying on storage provider to make all these chains working of snapshot chains. So that's, I mean, that is the, that is the underlying, like the, the, the main theory that we have had from the beginning is that with Kubernetes, people would be using uh, snapshot capable storage. And certainly it is much simpler from our end in kubevert if we don't concern ourselves with any of that stuff. Um, and we leave it to the storage. 
and that is the case a lot of times but in the like for example in the presentation from nvidia uh they had an interesting case about you know shared uh like base operating system images that they wanted to disperse uh to all the nodes of the cluster and um and then launch uh you know basically clones from that base image really quickly um but yeah, there's multiple ways to solve this for sure. And we've so far focused on the one that says, let's leave it up to the storage. So I have a question, like pardon my ignorance because I don't know the details. So if the hardware provides the capability of snapshotting, uh, what happens to the page cache uses on the node? Like uh, when I'm, if the multiple, if I launch multiple VMs, my understanding is that I'll end up creating multiple copies of the same block on the node in the page cache, despite the fact they are being shared only because the only storage knows about it backend. Mm -hmm. is, is that a correct understanding or not? I would say I so. It depends, on, it depends on storage provider because for example, Ceph can or Lean Store can use uh, the basic images mm -hmm. and store the data on one place, but the changed data, uh, the delta of this data will be stored on some place where VM is running, or in case of Ceph, somewhere else on different blocks. But the base ones will continue be. Yeah, if I remember well, TDI has few options how to clone the images to use snapshots of the storage system or use know them. So it depends on configuration, I guess. Okay. I mean, I mean, if you do, I think in the Ceph case, you would have, you know, if you have two clones from the same snapshot, they're going to be separate RBD devices that are mounted as separate, separate block devices on the node. And so, yeah, to the extent that there would be any kind of intelligence there about how they're related, I can't see how that would work based on my understanding. Um, so, yeah, I think you have uh, a potential. It'd be interesting to see what kind of performance gains you would get in a typical case when, when you have multiple VMs reading from the same shared layer. Yeah, at least in the container, regular container words, like when the overlay FS came along, like we had this big emphasis on sharing page caches because it reduced our memory footprint on the node and then people could pack more condensed, like uh, more containers on the same node. So like container density was the keyword. And of course, we want to minimize the resource uses. And overlay mm -hmm. FS were good at it. So I think the same basic principle will apply here as well. That if, this, if you're doing uh, using QM or QC to layer uh, for sharing the single base image, then you get that efficiency of sharing base cache on the node, if I understand correctly. Yeah, I think you I think you would be right. Um, it's definitely it would definitely be difficult to manage. I think this kind of. Uh, system it would be it'd be interesting to, to consider how that would work and um i think the i mean it's a different model mm -hmm. to be sure um i'm definitely concerned about how it would affect um some of the higher level kubernetes operations because we definitely you know we don't want to um like for example when you if they were to expand a pvc that was a qcow2 layer like how would that do, would we need specific virtualization hooks to respond to that? Um, like, how would it work with uh, snapshots or clones? Uh, all these things would need to be thought about and and considered carefully um, to make sure that we don't get ourselves into a situation where um, our storage works differently than the platform would would expect. Uh, disaster recovery and backup and restore are other examples. No, yeah, fair enough. Like, uh, yeah, everything else needs to be considered. That whole thing should come together if we move in this direction or for this optimization. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing, like, uh, I don't know, like I was guessing that if it is a separate writable layer and a shared base image, then, then like, uh, 
And if it is a non-shared storage, I was thinking then it makes the migration a little easy. They can just, you should be able to send just the writable layer to a different node and. Yep. Uh, so if, if there are use cases where people are using local NVMe SSD or something, and I don't know if that is the case or not, or I'm just imagining. So that was another thing I was thinking, does it make sense or not? If, if it makes sense, then QCOW2 writable layer can help there as well. Yeah, I mean, that would be, yeah. So that would be interesting. Like, for example, I could imagine if the base uh, base layer was stored in a registry, then that could be pulled uh, to any node that wants to run a virtual machine that requires that. Um, and, you know, you'd have to be careful about managing uh, versions of that base image, but um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I think it would be cool. I mean, from a kubevert API level, you would need a way to convey in the VM spec that you have multiple PVCs that build a, a, an actual logical VM disk. Um, and then we'd have to make sure that, I mean, those, those uh, for example, the writable layer would have to reference unknown location. Well, I guess you could have a relative uh backing chain reference i believe uh, they got rid of those in uh in overt i th i think but we could potentially use those um and uh you know making sure that images appear in a reliable uh path which i think they already do so it would be interesting i'd love to see somebody try that um i know nvidia has and they're successful um it would be interesting to see what how you could extend the API to implement something like that um, if you were interested. And then we could start to experiment with what breaks when you do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering specifically, like not getting too complicated and adding, you know, any number of layers from a base image, but just like have a, if we had just extend a container disk to have like, uh, could, you could give it a PVC name and the right layer would go to a PVC. Um, and we can already live migrate container disks, so it would live migrate. Um, it may be a cheap uh, way to try this out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting way to um, to think of it. Because yeah, and really, I think that's the common case. It's we're not trying to do internal snapshots or like yeah, snapshot like QMU snapshots within the QCOW two layers. Although one could do something like that, um, but uh, I mean, your use case is a simple a simple one. Well, it doesn't and even it, have to be a QCOW two file. I mean, you can still layer raw, right? I mean. Raw can be the base, but the the writable oh, okay. layer has to be QCOW too. Okay. Um, it, here can be. Um, so here's one thing I was wondering, which I've never tried. Can the base layer be like a you know 10 gig image, and the QCOW be like a 40 gig or something? Because I think that's you probably would want something like that to be able to. Um, have a bigger disk because right now you know when we you we can have we'll expand disk images to fill you know the entire pvc so if you have a golden image that's small you can make it bigger and that's just one that's just one technical thing i was wondering about but that i mean it's probably not um a big deal yeah i don't know the answer to that um but I don't know. I think that uh, may be an interesting experiment. Uh, I can't imagine it would be too hard to whip together a prototype for that. But, mm -hmm. but I think uh, generally what, what is interesting to me would be uh, use cases from the community because, you know, I, I think the single, I think we chose, and maybe it is worth just communicating in some other way somewhere why we chose, you know, raw and, you know, one PVC per PM disk. Um, but I think it is, you know, just an easier way to reason about things. Um, and, 
probably makes the most sense for kind of long running VMs that will be around for a while, but maybe for kind of, uh, or um, not as long living, but you still need some persistence and you want to optimize uh, host storage page cache, whatever. It could be, it, it just could be good for specific use cases. Sorry, I'm just capturing a couple of notes from the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that is somewhat related, but not really, is I think Stefan was talking about bootable containers. And if that, I don't know if that's related or not, but that could be kind of interesting too, because I'm what is, I don't know, I don't have the context. Was that in a thread somewhere or? Uh, I think so, yeah. There was something about, uh, they're working on containers that are bootable, um, which may be related, I don't know. Hmm. Oh yeah, now I vaguely remember that thread, bootable containers. Hmm. So it's still using the same, uh, the same host kernel, but somehow the kernel provides an interface that allows you to like boot from an empty context or something. I'm, I'd be more, I don't want to try to make it up here. So I'd be yeah, really interested yeah. in a point or two uh, into that. Yeah, maybe so we I'm can talk about it next next meeting or something, but yeah, I, I, I forget what that's all about. Okay, so I'd love to I'd love to hear more about that. If somebody can find um, a public link to where that was discussed, I'd love to see it added here. Um, if you're able to, if anyone knows where that is, that's super interesting of an, of an idea. Um, okay, cool. So, does anybody have any other topics uh, that was interesting? Uh, and again, yeah, I would say that this is definitely a call for use uh, use cases. Uh, from the community, it'd be cool. Like we got a really cool example from the video that they shared at Kubebert Summit. So um, if you're interested and hadn't haven't seen it, I definitely recommend checking out that presentation uh, when the recordings are released, if they haven't been already. I think the recordings are available now. That's why you watch the recording now. So yeah. I have a, in general follow-up question, I'm sort of trying to get a sense. So if I understood correctly, NVIDIA is using local storage there and they don't even require live migration. Have you heard of such cases, use cases from others as well? Like uh, typically my understanding is we have heavily relied on shared storage and where people have long running VMs. So they require live migration and everything. Like that's the direction we are primarily focused on. Now, so yeah, so I think there are, uh, when you have single single node Kubernetes clusters, um, I think there are some people edge, if you will, like consider maybe like um, a single, uh, single node cluster in a retail store that wants to run virtual machines. And in this case, you're not, you know, having to worry about, you just have a single, uh, single node. So in those cases, I think, um, the local storage is making more sense. Um, and also the nature of the data is a bit more ephemeral. Like if you consider like a retail store workload, uh, the real critical data is the transaction log and that's getting uploaded to um, a central data center. So uh, whatever else is, is stored locally is a bit more it's a little less important, so you don't need to worry about replication as much and those kind of things. Uh, so this is my understanding about when that can make sense. Yeah, single node definitely makes um, sense because anyway, there are no other nodes in the cluster. So where would the line migration happen? So, but what I'm also yep. concerned, uh, thinking if if you do, uh, NVIDIA seem to have a cluster. It's not a single node if I understand correctly. and and uh, mm -hmm. cluster with non-shared storage. So is that the first thing? I think the first time, uh, at least to my knowledge, I saw somebody talking about it. 
I was curious if other people have witnessed similar deployments, similar use cases being talked about. Well, I, I think NVIDIA is looking at the VMs more like, you know, normal people would look at containers like, you know, if they get destroyed, it'll just get started somewhere else and, and we're not that worried about it. Uh, right. And in that case, like migration doesn't really make that much sense because if, if you're considering it just like a you know, somewhat special container, but not like super special, it's not like a pet, um, then, you know, if it dies and it starts somewhere else, it's fine. So, so basically cattle class VMs, if somebody right. can identify that these VMs are cattle class, then we can just treat them like containers, start them on one node and don't worry about live migration and the restart if it dies. Exactly. Yeah. Especially if they're, uh, if they're also, um, more job focused where they're going to, they're going to run for a short period of time because then, you know, the scheduling issue isn't as big of a deal because the VMs are always starting and stopping. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. I think this will be a, uh, something, a use case I'll be interested in a sort of evolving theme. I'll just keep an eye on this. Yeah, and I didn't have uh, I didn't have a like something to link to, but in my head, I've been thinking about um, uh, live storage migration, which kind of came up here in this, the context of this previous topic. Um, and really, in the context of Kubernetes, it's if you want to drain a node so you can perform maintenance or upgrade the software on it. Um, and, and as as uh, all of you know, we require read write many storage for that. So. Um, I've been considering uh, as another project or interesting, um, yeah, thing to look at is how we can enable uh, migration of the storage generically, uh, even for read write once storage, even if it's less efficient. So um, I'll probably bring that up as another topic if I create an issue upstream for that in the future, but it's also related. So it's cool to see us kind of always uh, going back to the basics and thinking about how things are uh, are architected and if there are improvements or changes we want to make. All right, uh, should we go to triage CDI issues at this point or are there any other topics from anyone uh, before we get to that? All right, sounds like we're ready. So we left off at 2576. Oh, so we've nearly gotten through the list. Um, so we are on this one. I don't recall discussing. Uh, I think we already discussed that one. Okay, let's take a look. Yeah, anyway, Ido is already working on that, so. Oh, great, okay. It's already covered. So we have it covered, thanks. Okay, so next it is importer pod permission denied for block storage. Okay, so we've got a PVC, read, write, many, block, except RBD, and we have an importer error. Let me scroll over, just permission denied. So we all, we've already seen uh, issues like this one before. Um, it, it's like the CRI problem that, uh, Alex reported so like you know very issue I think okay okay so he's uh, he's asking for documentation yeah but uh we already have some documentation about this so like I don't, I, I think we could improve it, but uh, we, we already have some documentation covering this. Okay. All right, so let me scroll all the way down. Seems like there's some good. Okay, so it looks like, um, yeah, I see. And it's been documented uh, for those who come later. So I think we could probably um, close this. Do you guys agree? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. And, and I'm pretty sure we have this documented in our docs in the repo. Uh, again, it might make sense to put that in the Uber.io user guide. But... Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, 
<clears throat> yeah, this is definitely a, a recurring theme. So, okay, uh, let me close this and we'll go to the next one. All right, so we have cannot upload to data volume and wait for first consumer state. So we just discussed this earlier today, um, something similar. Let's see where we're at. So Alvaro, it looks like you were involved in the in the issue. So yeah, it was just that uh, we defaulted uh, on our wait for first consumer to true in one fifty six. So uh, the behavior was changed, and the user wasn't expecting that. So yeah, it wasn't really uh, a bug. Okay, so they did not want. Uh, wait for first consumer. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay. All right. So, is this documented well? Um, what do we need? Is there anything we need to do to um to close this one out before we? So we already have documentation covering this. Um, like in the last comment, uh, another user suggested to update the labs, the CDI labs. And I just posted a comment in our chat uh, proposing it because mm -hmm. it's true that they are very, very outdated. Okay. Do we know who um, uh, who contributed those labs to begin with? Because we could just uh, talk to that person directly and see if they would update it. Is it Chandler? That would be my first guess. And, okay. Uh, if it wasn't Chandler, we can probably ask Andrew to figure out. Uh, okay. There's probably a repo we can modify to fix it. Okay. Yeah, there should be. Isn't there kubert.github.io repo? Yeah, I think so. All right, so I'm just going to put in uh, a com uh, an item in the agenda. Um, find the owner of this uh, because it needs an update relative uh, or due to changes in wait for first consumer behavior. Okay. So not sure who wants to take that, but we do have it captured at least. Um, great. So let's go on. Uh, we have fatal glibc error. This is the one that came up earlier today. Do we want to talk anything further about this one today? Or what's the next step? So I guess? I'm doing yeah, some research. I'm still doing some research about this and I don't have any conclusions. So it's just like the, so the error seems to be happening in um, virtualization platforms when uh, trying to virtualize new uh, OSs with a high uh, CPU requirements. So yeah. I don't think it's really a problem on, on, on CDI side. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm still trying to do a little bit of research, but I like I don't know I don't know if we can do anything about this. Yeah, it seems it definitely seems uh, below our level. Although I would like I mean it seems like a lot more stuff should be breaking, uh, and so I'm surprised that it isn't. So, but I yeah I don't have the. So I um, I see this happening in uh, like in forums and other places and like the common cause seems to be the kvm64 processor and even mm -hmm. in kimu documentation it's not recommended so i guess it's and other things are not breaking because uh, i guess kvm64 is not really used that much okay all right so it seems like the solution would be to set up the environment so that it's using a different machine type. Um, Cause yeah, we test Qvert with specific, uh, very specific machine types. Okay. Um, so 
yeah, I guess that would so, be the question. Uh, another question that I have uh, for Andre is, uh, so you said that this is working with other Qbeard related workloads, right? Yeah, for some, yes. For some workloads, it works. For some of them, it's not. I mentioned in a, in and down, there is a command for running a virtual operator and it works. Mm -hmm. So I think we could use some building to avoid adding. Not sure, Gosam has some options uh, for avoid using C. Maybe if we would avoid using C, <clears throat> in binaries, mm -hmm. it would yeah. make work, uh, make CDI working on such environments. So maybe we should try if this started to fail when we started using like a uh, CentOS Stream 9 as the base image for CDI. I think that was pro probably the like the change that uh, break this. Yeah, but as you can see, the virt operator works fine. It yeah, it shows some error, but that's just because I run it on pure Docker with no configuration. But it works. While the other images they report this glibc error. I think we can try avoiding glibc somehow in our binaries. Um, I'm not sure. You know the the Qbert version that you're using here? The latest ones. 59. Ah, right, right. Yeah, so, right. So yeah, I, I think know. we could, I think we could, uh, Avaro, we could compare the uh, Docker file um, that's used to build Vert operator um, versus the uh, CDI. Yeah. Uh, well, in this case, I see Vert, ha so Vert handler, is failing. Virt handler, Virt Langer also failing, mm -hmm. but Virt operator works. So it might, it probably has to do with, um, yeah, if there's certain libraries that that pull in glibc um, versus just a, a pure, because it makes sense that like Virt operator would be able to be just a pure Golang binary because all it's doing is manipulating Kubernetes resources where uh, vert handler or CDI, we're doing things with uh, with uh, you know QMU components that are going to be written in C and then have glibc dependencies. Um, okay, yeah. So that's I think this is a, a a bit more fundamental of a problem that would probably take a long time to fix. I guess I wonder: is it possible on your platform? Uh, to change this to use the recommended um, like host CPU setting or or do you not have control of that? Yes, we do, but we are developing a platform which is able which able to install on many cloud platforms. Um, I see. And we can't control all those environments, and we don't even know on which environments it getting to be installed. We have a lot of components uh, like, I know, Cert Manager, Jinx Ingress, Kubeweird as well, Instore, I don't know, so many components and none of them have this problem. Just CDI and probably Kubeweird, but Kubeweird is getting installed and get used only on hardware, mm -hmm. uh, on bare metal servers. So I think it shouldn't be a problem, but CDI can also be used for other purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so I just be... looked at the Qbert build Basil, and it looks like it's doing static equals on for um, a lot of the binaries. And I think we can probably do the same. I think the only one we can't do is the importer. Hmm, okay. So could you check if, uh, are you able to see, Michael, if Vert Handler is not using it? Because that might be a, a bellwether then. Uh, yeah, it's not. Okay. So that could be, um, so maybe we can add, I'll have you maybe add a comment, Michael, uh, to the issue. Um, it'd be something worth trying. 
Um, yeah, so let's do that. I'll have you add a comment. I don't know if, uh, if Andre, if you could actually try that um, suggestion and see if you get some more mileage out of it on your environment, that might be a good next step. I didn't so get what should I do? Uh, so Michael will leave a comment here in the in the yeah. Screen. I'll link to where where the setting is in a in a Basil build, and you can maybe try it for yourself. Thank you. We'll do that. And yeah. We'll okay. Report. Sounds good. Great. Okay. Uh, let's take. A, I think we have one more uh, to say that we've finished the list. So um, I think we. Uh, this one looks familiar with the lost and found. Um, do we have a PR that was going to be addressing this? I think Michael, you might have been working on it. Oh, yeah, it has been merged. just fixed in 2676. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yep. Okay. So, all we need to do is wait for confirmation from the reporter that. Yeah. So, the reporter solved. is, uh, <laughs> so kind of going back to one of the issues that uh, earlier about the um, device permissions. So, this reporter, you know, I know them through like the Slack, and for whatever reason, they they cannot set those uh, device permissions. So they're on an old version of CDI 154, I think. Mm. They're still running as root, and yeah, for whatever reason, they they can't make those CRI changes. They can't update. Um, so they're uh, asking very kindly to um, backport this. Uh, to 154 for them. Okay. Um, is that reasonable? Seems like, a, is it a simple one? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we did it for the uh, immediate retry issue. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, we can't do this forever. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I would leave it, obviously, it's up to you guys if it's something that you're able to do, or uh, maybe they could submit the cherry pick. Yeah. Well, the, you know, they want to build, really. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think they would they would probably uh, like for us to have an option to, you know, run as root. Um, and it, something we discussed and said uh, we decided to hold off on. Um, yeah. But. Yeah. At some point, we won't we won't be able to be you know helping to maintain like old old branches after a certain point. But they're welcome to carry fixes in you know in a local fork or something if they need to. So okay. Um, all right, so I think that is the last issue. Probably nothing else we, we can. We'll figure out what to do with respect to the backporting and stuff, and then that issue would be able to be closed. And so I think we're kind of at the uh, the end here. Did anyone have any last minute uh, thoughts, questions, comments, etc.? Just short question. Um, how the Sorry, uh, if you have PVC or DT volume in one namespace and user has no privileges to this namespace and he's querying to create DT volume of this PVC from the namespace he not owns, how the CDI is ensuring the security? Uh, yeah, so uh, basically there are a couple of things. There is... Uh, when you create the data volume that accesses a different namespace, we'll check either can that user create a pod in that other namespace? And if so, you kind of de facto have access to it. Um, there is also an explicit RBAC um, that we have called like uh, CDI Cube data volumes source. I'll find the documentation. I think it's documented somewhere. But there's also an explicit check. So what we do, like when we, um, for our downstream, we have a golden images namespace that everyone can access. So we give, you know, system authenticated user access to this data volumes source explicit permission. So anyone can, can 
can get them. Um, Got it. Uh, and how uh, is the name of this namespace? Is it explicit or can I specify it somehow? Uh, so you, what you would do is create a... Uh, um, I want to create golden images repository, yes. In the yeah, so you'll create a role that has this permit that, that has um, uh, basically I create data volumes slash source is the uh, resource. I'll find an example and, and, and show you. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would create a role binding to uh, for system authenticated user. So it's basically all users have that permission then. Okay, I'll yeah. take a look. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so uh, I wonder if th that's probably being done in the uh, hyper converged cluster operator repository within KubeVert, the HCO, um, I guess is that- No, I think it's done in the um, uh, SSP, right? So they do golden images. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not, it'd be interesting to, yeah, see if we could find the, but it's going to be in one of these projects that's not uh, CDI or CubeVert, um, which um, kind of creates the um, sort of the de facto environment. Um, so yeah, but it sounds like Michael would be able to give you some specific examples. Uh, I'm gonna put a link in the chat right now. Cool. Thank you. All right, and uh, I guess I'll hold the, oh, let's see, yeah, he did place that in the chat, so it's there. Um, so I think we're ready to wrap up here. It's about five, two, so. Um, Thanks everybody for joining in the participation. It was a good discussion as always. Uh, so we will catch up with you guys the next meeting in two weeks. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.